This week on Dialogue, Little America, the war within the war for Afghanistan. Welcome to the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. I'm John Molusky. Each week, Dialogue explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. This week, our guest is a former Wilson Center public policy scholar. Rajiv Chandrasekharan is a senior correspondent and associate editor for The Washington Post. He's the author of Imperial Life in the Emerald City, a best-selling account of the American effort to reconstruct Iraq. Today, we're going to talk about his eagerly awaited new book, Little America, The War Within the War for Afghanistan. Rajiv, welcome back to Dialogue, and welcome back to the Wilson Center. Good to be here. Nice to see you back in the in these halls. Another great title. I, w I was I was looking at the book, and I know uh, who comes up with the title. You were the editor. Uh, I did, and uh, the title comes from uh, the the term Afghans used in the 1950s to describe. Uh, what would then become the capital of Helmand province, part of southern Afghanistan. Um, and, and this was uh, what they, how they described the place because there were so many Americans at the time there, six decades ago, working as engineers and aid workers trying, trying to help develop that part of Afghanistan. And that was unfinished business then, and it continues to be unfinished business today. Yes, you know, I started uh, sitting here at the Wilson Center examining this little known, little told history of America and Afghanistan, um, not knowing too much about it. And as I learned more, it would have these amazing parallels to the story today. And you're talking, the time frame is pre-Soviet invasion. Yes, the time frame is uh, immediately after World War II. Um, the Afghan government, flush with, with money at the end of the Second World War, in, in large part because of the export of pelts of newborn Persian fat-tailed sheep that were sent to the United States to make fur coats and hats for ladies in New York, um, the Afghan government, with that money, decided to try to vault the relatively primitive southern part of its country into a more modern era by hiring a large American construction firm, Morrison Knudsen, to come and build dams along the Helmand River and a network of irrigation canals that they hoped would feed new farmland that would turn that part of Afghanistan into the country's breadbasket, easing shortages and helping to, to uh, create a degree of self-sufficiency for the country. And so over those following years, dozens upon dozens of Americans, um, many of them uh, civil engineers, showed up in Afghanistan to work on this massive development project in the very same terrain where the surge would unfold starting in 2009. Now, uh, describe your reporting method. You, you spend a lot of time in country. Yes, I spent about two and a half years traveling back and forth between my home in Washington, D.C. and Afghanistan. I uh, made probably 15 or 16 trips in that time, each one for anywhere between two and four weeks, uh, spending a lot of time traveling around southern Afghanistan as well as in the capital, Kabul, uh, a lot of time with, with the U.S. military and, and NATO forces, but also a lot of time out on my own. And, and a lot of the people who became interview subjects or characters in the book, some of them you'd encountered in working on the previous book in Iraq. One of them, in fact, was this young man who uh, served as a political advisor to the Marine unit that went in in 2009. And he, uh, at that point, had spent six years already between Iraq and Afghanistan. I had met him in 2003 in the Green Zone in Iraq, and we had kept in touch, when he was heading to Afghanistan, he urged me to come and spend some time with him and the Marine general he was going to be advising. I got to know both of them very well. And his well. name was, his, we're talking about Weston here. Cale right? Weston was, was, the, was the State Department officer, the, the, the civilian who, who I knew and who spent a, a total of seven years in the two war zones, and his boss, uh, Brigadier General Larry Nicholson. And Cale's introduction to Nicholson meant that I was given a degree of access that was pretty much unheard of for a journalist uh, out covering the war. And I, I spent days on end traveling with Nicholson as he, as he went to all of the bases that were under his command in, in Helmand province, sat in meetings with him, um, 
uh, strategy sessions and really came to understand the, uh, the American military mission in the South from, from the inside out. Now, you, you know, obviously, uh, people who you're reporting <laughs> on are going to make mistakes along the way. That's a large part of the narrative of what went wrong. Uh, what about the, the trust factor? Is it, why are people willing to be so open and talk to you and allow you to travel with them and observe when they know the possibility is they don't come out of this looking good? Well, I think the two principal characters here, Cale Weston and Larry Nicholson, are, are great Americans who believe in um, the importance of an honest historical record. Uh, their concern was reporting material right away that might somehow jeopardize the lives of the troops under their control or missions they would be about to undertake. But they weren't afraid to really let me see the good, the bad, and the ugly, to, to see the warts, to understand what was right and what was wrong, and to also understand the points of difference. Um, my two central characters had a very different view about how the troops should be used, the places they should deploy to, uh, the importance of clearing out some towns of the Taliban or leaving those places for the Afghan army to handle for themselves. Um, and they were willing to let me see some of those disagreements, sometimes not very pretty, as a way to better understand um, how decisions were made and the fact that um, they were willing to consider all points of view. And while I ultimately think that General Nicholson perhaps pushed into a couple of places that he shouldn't have gone into, it wasn't for at least a lack of discussion. And um, though, though they were perhaps too expansive, that year that I spent with them, I still believe was the most entrepreneurial year of the war for U.S. forces in Afghanistan. It was a, it was a, it was a brief bright spot but otherwise surrounded by an awful lot of mistakes and a mission that, that at its core uh, came to be fundamentally unsustainable. Is the, is the lesson there that if there was clarity and follow through, this could end up very differently? Well, I think that if there was a deeper understanding of Afghanistan from the beginning, we would have made different, when I say we, Washington, the White House, right. the president, his war cabinet, would have made different decisions Decisions, I believe, that could have um, led to a more modest, sustainable mission. I ultimately come to agree with, with Kale Weston, who was an early Obama fan who supported the initial increase of troops soon after Obama took office, but disagreed on the big 30,000 troop surge that, that Obama authorized in late 2009. He felt that that was just too much and that what the Afghans needed to do was to assume more responsibility for themselves. And what the United States needed was not a go big strategy, but a go long strategy. Yeah, he, he talked about it as a marathon versus not a sprint. A sprint. Well, what is this? Is this some fundamental flaw in America's view of reality that we're looking for a quick fix and that to understand an ancient culture, you have to be thinking long term? Well, I think that we were also a little deluded by our experience in Iraq, where we surged forces there and very quickly saw some changes in Baghdad. Mm. Um, and without belaboring this discussion, uh, let me just argue that, that the, the reason things turned around in Iraq were far more complex than simply sending in tens of thousands of additional troops. But there was the sense, particularly among senior military leaders, that pushing in more troops quickly could fundamentally change the equation. And ultimately, um, Afghanistan, as Weston notes, is this marathon is a country that in many ways is resistant to that sort of quick change, that things will happen in an evolutionary way, and, the, and uh, sustainable change will take place when the Afghans start to, to do more of this themselves. And what the, the Americans and the rest of the international community need to do is to be there to support them but not necessarily do it all for them. Early in the book, uh, I think maybe even in the introduction or first chapter, you quote a Marine who says, sir, we patrol until we hit an IED, improvised explosive device, and then we call the medevac and go back to the base, and then we do it again the next day. There's something hauntingly uh, uh, disturbing about this notion that there's no there there. There's nothing being accomplished. We're spinning our wheels. I mean, it's like the, the character from Greek mythology, Sisyphus, who carries the boulder up the hill only to have to do it again the next day. Mm -hmm. um, there certainly was a feeling of, uh, of that in, in many parts of Afghanistan where they, they would go in, clear out the Taliban, only to have the insurgents 
eventually roll back in. Um, now, the, the, the response to this uh, from the military's point of view was if we send enough troops there to saturate these areas, to engage in a counterinsurgency strategy, which involves protecting the population, essentially, instead of focusing on hunting down the bad guys, protecting the good people from the bad um, with, with the belief that once the, the good people feel safe, ordinary life resumes, it deprives the insurgency of the, the resources it needs to, to sustain itself. Even in the case of an, a now abandoned town, that sometimes <laughs> if you keep it safe or empty from insurgents, the good people will return. That was certainly Nicholson's thinking with, with regard to one key abandoned town in northern Helmand province. The, the problem was, um, with, with the amount of troops we had, could we afford to be in all those places? And were we tackling the right places first? And, and one of the, the, uh, uh, the, the key points of this book, one, one of the, uh, I believe, uh, new points that I argue in this, is that we squandered the first year of the troop surge. Essentially, we squandered a whole year of the war by sending so many Marines to Helmand province as opposed to Kandahar province. Now, these names may not mean much to many listeners uh, and viewers, but what we did was instead of focusing in on the second largest city in the country, a place that has been the sort of the symbolic and spiritual capital for the Taliban, the city by which if you captured, you essentially had had a foothold to take over the entire country, which we, which is what the Taliban used. It's Canada back to Alexander the, the Great. Alexander the Great and what the Taliban did in the 1990s. So when Obama took office and authorized more troops, we should have sent those forces to Kandahar and the areas around it. Instead, we sent them off to meaningless patches of desert, and we wasted With a lot of time. With four percent of the nation's population, or something, I think is the figure Helmand you was four percent of the population. Where that initial tranche of Marines went who, was one percent. Who made that decision? Why, why did it turn out that way? Well, it, it, it was made by a number of people, but it was fundamentally the result of tribal politics in the Pentagon. It was because the Marines didn't want to play ball in the same sandbox with the Army. They wanted their own, their own corner of the sandbox, their own contiguous battle space, as they called it, where they could fly their own helicopters and have their own supply convoys instead of sharing with the Army and the Canadian forces under the NATO flag in Kandahar. So as a result, the only place they could be given was this patch of central Helmand province that yes, had a few important pockets, but also had a lot of unimportant desert. You, you describe a decision-making process in, in various stages of decision-making along the, the couple years that you cover, that it really sounds like the classic too many chefs spoil the broth. That, and ultimately, uh, Secretary Gates emerges as a deal-maker, someone who can thread the needle and find the way to bring the sides together, but you end up with compromises. So on, in the surge, you end up splitting the difference between President or Vice President Biden's worldview with less troops, or or the the military command's view for more troops, uh, is this a, a whole process that is designed for half measures and ultimately failure? Well, one could argue that whole process led to a middle ground solution that was untenable. There was uh, no solution at all. The commanders got much of the tr the requests that they put in for troops, but they also got a deadline that ultimately sapped a lot of the momentum of the surge. Um, you could argue that um, either a, a, a large surge with no deadline was, was a reasonable thing to do, or a narrower um, troop increase more focused on counterterrorism, going after big fish Taliban leaders uh, and al-Qaeda members was, was a defensible approach. Either one, I think, you could have argued would have worked better, as opposed to this middle ground approach. Um, I think it was it's Mr. Sort of, Weston, and you say referred to that as a big bluff, this middle yeah. ground approach. <coughs> what Cale Weston believed, well, let me rephrase this. What, what um, you know, Cale Weston saw the surge as, as, as something of a bluff, where we send all these troops out there to leverage reconciliation, to get the Taliban talking to us and the Afghan government, to get the Pakistani government to start cracking down on insurgent sanctuaries, to get the Afghan government to start providing services to the people and fielding a more competent army. But if, if the surge wasn't doing that, then the bluff didn't work. And that's what he came to believe. 
Um, and he, did he believe it was because of the deadline attached to it that, you know, the, the, the insurgents knew there was an end game for the U.S.? Well, he thought the deadline was a mistake, but he also thought sending in so many more troops was a mistake mm -hmm. because what that meant was that you, you wound up charging into places you didn't need to go. You wound up doing things that the Afghans could at some point do for themselves. It, it, it crowded out their, um, their responsibility and their willingness to, to actually do the hard work of counterinsurgency. The uh, Eikenberry cable that you outline on pages, I think, 124 and 125, I won't read it here, but uh, he lists six reasons why the surge won't work. Uh, so this is not a, a case where you can say that there was consensus about what was going to happen and, and then it just went wrong because of conditions on the ground. There were people who were, were telling the president, telling the leadership up front that there were deep work. There were deep divisions among Obama's war cabinet. Um, but ultimately, the president, a first-term young Democratic president, didn't want to f fully cross his generals by saying, I'm not going to give them what they want. And I think the hope was that they could surge for a short period of time to then exit, to create enough momentum, create a narrative of some progress so they could start to pull back. Would a more, I mean, I, I don't want to drag you into a partisan discussion on this because I know that you're a reporter and not a pundit, <laughs> but what you're saying suggests that a more grizzled veteran president might have made a different decision. Are you suggesting that there's some uh, lack of experience for the president, that his youth did come into play in a significant way? You know, I, I, I'm not able to get inside the president's head sure. or how he made his decision, but I do believe that, that many of those around him had real reservations about the surge. Um, and I'm not sure this is an issue of, of experience. I think that, that they, 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 they saw the various um, arguments uh, on, on both sides. Um, but I also think this was, this was one where politics did, did play a role, that um, you didn't want to be seen. Remember, this was before we killed Osama bin Laden, when the Taliban was gathering momentum. Obama had campaigned on Iraq being the bad war and implicitly Afghanistan being the good war. He didn't want to oppose both wars. And so he couldn't come into office and automatically say, you know what, guys, forget about everything I said on the campaign trail. I'm going to start de-escalating the Afghan war very quickly. So there was campaign baggage there, too. But then everything starts to change because, you know, ultimately, I think a full counterinsurgency strategy could have had a chance of working if we had committed multiple years on the ground, if we had a better partner in the Afghan government, if President Karzai's government was not as corrupt, was not as malevolent as it is. But ultimately, for the White House, a lot of this decision came down to, to, to cost in terms of lives and limbs, but also dollars. You know, we were spending $100 billion a year for the Afghanistan mission. At a time of great economic crisis at home, as Obama noted, last summer as he announced the drawdowns said america it's time to focus on nation building here at home you know why are we out there spending millions and millions of dollars to build new roads in afghan uh towns and cities when our roads are crumbling and and, and so uh, it, this was going through the mind of people at the white house you know in these little districts of helmand province home to no more than 70 or 80,000 people all of whom live in mud walled huts with no electricity no running water uh, where they live like they did centuries ago, we were spending a billion dollars a year to sustain a marine battalion in each of those places. And then when you look at the amount of money we were, for instance, providing the entire nation of Egypt in, in aid in the post arab Spring environment, advisors in the White House were saying, this is completely out of whack. Bad investment is how it was viewed. Uh, that you, you mentioned President Karzai and the dysfunction there, and, and the Eikenberry cable, which I referenced, leads off with that as point yep. number one of why it can't work. Expand on that a bit for us. Tell us, what was the Karzai government doing or not doing that was undermining the larger goals? Well, the, the American counterinsurgency strategy depended on the Afghan government providing services to its people, things like working schools and health clinics down at the town and village level, agricultural assistance, so that the people of the country, when faced with a choice whether to side with the Taliban, who were not just a, a radical Islamist group, but also promised things like swift justice, promised fighting corruption, promised law and order. When faced with that, the Afghan people could say, 
my government offers me a better deal. And what the American military hoped was that if they could provide security in towns and villages, the Afghan government would come to those places, provide those services. People would then say, ah, I'm going to cast my lot with the government. I'm either going to get off the fence or I'm going to stop supporting the Taliban and I'm going to support the Karzai government. The problem was the Afghan government was, was slow and incompetent at providing those services. And when they got people down to the local level, in many cases, they were shaking people down for bribes. They were beating people up. And so people at the local level said, you know what, the Taliban actually treats me better in many cases than the Afghan government does. We tried to address these issues, but fundamentally, the Afghan government was resistant to change. Why? Because there was a, there's a fundamental disconnect. President Karzai did not believe in America's counterinsurgency strategy. He didn't see the problem as bad governance and corruption at the local level. To him, it was all about infiltration of militants from Pakistan. He couldn't understand why we didn't deploy all of our troops on the border with Pakistan to keep the militants from flowing in. I want to ask you about another of these wars within the larger war. Uh, you already mentioned the, this, what you described as tribalism between the United States Army and the United States Marines. Uh, also, you write about disagreements among the allies, uh, the inability of the United States and the UK in particular <laughs> to work in concert. Could you tell us uh, how that manifested itself? We'd like to think that this, this NATO mission uh, with now 50 plus members, they all get along. Um, the truth is, in some cases, there was an awful lot of bickering. And, and, and some of the worst infighting occurred down in the south in Helmand province, where there were about 10,000 British troops and about 20,000 Marines. Prior to the arrival of the Marines, prior to Obama taking office, it was, it was largely only British forces there. As the, as the Americans rolled in, and all of a sudden there was sort of a two-to-one now uh, difference between Americans and Brits, um, the, the Marines wanted to um, engage in a far more expansive approach of taking on the Taliban and rebuilding than the British thought was wise. And this caused an awful lot of friction, where the Brits were, said, look, we need to focus only on the most critical areas. The Marines saw them as being appeasers and uh, pushed into places that the British thought they shouldn't go. Uh, and there was a lot of fighting, in part because the British government controlled a lot of the reconstruction resources in the province. And so the Marines would go to a place, fight the Taliban, and say, all right, now we need our reconstruction workers here. And the British-run reconstruction team would say, well, we didn't think it was a good idea for you to go there, so we're not going to be sending anybody there. And then, you know, the infighting ensued. Mm, wow. So how dysfunctional can it get? You also, um, uh, there's a story you write about... Uh, Let's see. Afghanistan was Larry Nicholson and Carl Weston's war. It was Dick Scott and Ken Dahl's war. It wasn't Obama's war, and it wasn't America's war. Put that. In, what does that mean? That's just, <laughs> if you don't take it out of context, that's a stunning statement. Well, what it means is, and, and all of those figures are key characters in the book. Those who went there, who spent one, two, three years there, at great personal peril, for them, Afghanistan was worth it. It was a mission that needed to be accomplished almost without regard to cost. They came to believe in the goodness of the mission, the importance of it, um, and they lived and breathed it. But this wasn't a war that really the rest of the country paid attention to, cared about, thought about. Um, and so what you have with Afghanistan is this small cadre of people who, for whom it is a defining moment of our time. And then for the rest of the country, it, it's halfway around the world, we don't know who's fighting whom, and I'd rather just not think about it. Well, is, is it a function of the complexity of the situation, or, or is it also tied to this all-volunteer army where a lot of the nation just doesn't have a horse in the race? John, that's a very good question. You know, we, we, have, we have a great military made up of, of men and women who voluntarily decide to serve our nation. Um, many of them live in military communities, separated from, from, from those who are not part of the active duty military, oftentimes by walls and gates. Mm -hmm. the, the largest purveyor of gated communities in our country is the U.S. Army. Um, 
And what that means is their experience is not necessarily a shared experience. Yes, when troops are in uniform at airports, people stop to thank them and they applaud at baseball games. But it's still, it, you know, it, it's an experience that isn't broadly shared or understood. You, um, you know, you have many streets in our country where, you know, nobody has a son serving in the military or they don't know anybody who's had that experience. Um, and so you, you get this disconnect because though for those who serve out there, they come to see the mission in very different terms than those who don't. And I'm not saying one is better or different than the other. No, understood. In fact, those who are serving uh, tend to sort of view the mission as, as sort of worth it at all costs. And in some ways, you know, step back and say, is it really worth uh, having the, the, you know, as many troops as we have, as many troops getting killed and wounded every week and month um, for, for this particular outcome at this time in our history and given the economic conditions we as a country face? Well, I hate to ask you this question, but I'm just curious, after all the hard work you've gone through, what's the next project? <laughs> I know you're just coming up. For, this hasn't even hit the stands yet. You, this book that we we're talking about today, uh, you'll be seeing this program uh, and in two days from now, three days from now. It will be on, news, or on newsstands and in bookstores and available on Amazon.com and all those other places. But what are you working <laughs> on next in the 10 seconds we have remaining? Well, I'm, I'm going back to the Washington Post, and I'll be working on, on stories in the national security foreign affairs area. Great. Well, Raj, great to have you on the beat because there's so much to be learned from your work. And uh, congratulations on hey, another excellent piece of work. Thank you. A real pleasure to talk to you. And, you know, this book would not have been possible without the support of the Woodrow Wilson Center. I wrote, I wrote much a nice of the, quiet place to write. I wrote much of the book within the walls of the Wilson Center. And it was, uh, once again, uh, provided me with great writing karma. Great. Excellent. We hope you'll be back for uh, your next book. Until Thank then, uh, we'll be back next week with another edition of Dialogue. So on behalf of all my colleagues here at the Wilton Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for joining us. We'd like to hear from you. Please send your questions or comments to dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. You can also follow us on Facebook. Search Dialogue Radio and Television. Our host Twitter feed is twitter.com slash John Malevsky. Dialogue is a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHZ Networks. Dialogue is available via broadcast, cable, satellite, and telco on MHZ Worldview throughout the United States. To see how to watch where you live, visit www.mhznetworks.org.